Hello and welcome on to another episode of the ISO Ball Podcast with your host, Derek Terrio, your place to learn about the NBA on and off the court. And we got a very special episode with you today. Uh, a guy I linked up with on Twitter was doing uh, a lot of uh, great tweets on his end and was interacting with a lot of my stuff. So I figured I'd reach out to him and he was nice enough to come on. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Bano Memory from Hoop Dreams Basketball. Appreciate you joining me, man. Thanks so much. Thank you. Appreciate you inviting me, Derek. Yeah, not a problem. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I checked out a lot of your stuff uh, before, you know, we kind of went and did this. And, you know, one of the reasons I had you on is because you have a very lengthy basketball resume in terms of touch points of kind of where you've been from coaching to player development, and all that stuff. And, you know, as a guy who's kind of just a league pass junkie who just kind of tries to touch so many different points of, you know, understanding the cap and, you know, following strength and conditioning coaches and, you know, skills trainers, I personally really don't have as many, you know, touch points and ways of experience as you do. So uh, I just want to give you a second here to just kind of, you know, go through kind of uh, your journey to where you've been today and uh, talk a little bit about the, the different places that you've been, the, the things that you've learned, uh, you know, over the years through coaching and otherwise. So I'll, I'll kind of give you the floor to talk about that a little bit. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, well, gosh, my playing career, you know, I, I really became a junkie for the game of basketball between my eighth grade and freshman year, but I was more in the baseball at the time. And, uh, you know, I go through high school, end up uh, playing JV as a junior, and get cut from varsity. So, I, you know, I kind of got a story and ended up uh, having to write like 40 different colleges to, to get one JUCO to take a chance on me. Um, that College of the Desert went my first year. Uh, Went to Clark College here in Vancouver my second year, and then uh, Belmont Abbey College, which is a Division II school in uh, Belmont, North Carolina, right outside of Charlotte. And then my last year at Cascade College, which is an NAI school back here in Portland, Oregon. Um, so I got to even be a journeyman player, uh, which to me, I always tell people that helped me um, learn what to do and what not to do from a lot of different coaches uh, when I got into my coaching career. Um, I eventually got lucky enough to start going out to the Blazer practice facility in between my junior and senior year of college. And I really believe that was like the epicenter and, and the biggest turning point in, in like kind of my life and career as basketball. For me, I was just lucky to be playing with and against, you know, like Damon Stoudemire, Rasheed Wallace, uh, you know, Jermaine O'Neal, Clipper. I mean, all these different names would be all around the, the gym. And so it was Some just fun to play. At that. Yeah, I mean, I could go, go, keep going on and on, but it's, uh, it also opens your mind up, and then you get to see that there's this other world of basketball. Um, and so when I started getting into the teaching, it was a guy named Dan Panaggio, who um, is one of the all-time CBA leading wins uh, coaches and then coached uh, with Mo Cheeks here in Portland. Um, I want to say he went with him to – Philadelphia for a little bit and then he coached Shanghai Sharks for Yao Ming's team in China but you know got a lengthy career but he saw something in me and said man I think you should coach youth basketball and I was like man well how much do you get paid <laughs> that was my first question but I went into it and next thing you know uh I was coaching an eighth grade basketball team uh volunteer and so once or twice a week I would go meet with Dan Panaggio at the Blazer practice facility um to just go over how to learn basketball. Like I was a player, but I now needed to teach it and see it from a different um, lens and perspective. So I was lucky enough to be getting it right, like from the top shelf. And so, you know, in NBA basketball, and you can see it now when we're watching the playoffs, like one of the biggest things that doesn't really seep into other levels is spacing on the offensive end. And then, you know, defensive positioning and how to guard screens and all this different stuff. And so, I was getting to see that at the beginning of my coaching career. Um, it wasn't like I was quote unquote a normal coach where I kind of worked my way up the ranks. Um, when I decided to start coaching, the people that were helping me were NBA coaches and NBA players mm -hmm. and whatnot. And so um, that kind of helped open things up. And from there, um, I started my business, Hoop Dreams Basketball. Um, you know, I've been born and raised here in Portland, Oregon my whole life. So I had a lot of relationships from there. And, once I started Hoop Dreams, I got into doing AAU basketball. Um, me and two of my best friends, a guy named Ime Udoka and Kendrick Williams, and we started a program called I-5 Elite uh, back in like 2006. And so for about four years, we got a chance to really impact our community 
um, in a way that there's a program here called self enhancement that works with inner city youth that they impacted us. And so we really put a lot of time into that back then just to jump off to a quick side note, you know, we're going to jump into some NBA stuff here. Ime Udoka is uh, assistant coach with the uh, Philadelphia 76ers mm -hmm. uh, for the listeners out there. And I guess what yesterday or two days, you know, Jim Boylan just got fired and his name is like the hottest name right now to be named the uh, Chicago Bulls coach. I was well, glad you threw that in there. Yeah, uh, what'd you say? I'm glad you threw that in there. That was going to be what I just uh, was about to say there. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll connect it. But the thing is, Ime, when we're, when we're coaching I-5 Elite, uh, a player would come to him with an issue and he would go, hey, man, get away from me. I'm not a coach. Go to Bino. <laughs> <laughs> and, that, and now he's being coveted and he, he's coaching. But, um, you know, we had a lot of fun doing that for, for about four years. And, and we had Terrence Jones, Terrence Ross, uh, Nigel Williams-Goss, Mike Moser, um, Stephen Holt, uh, Jordan Rayleigh. I mean, we had a bunch of kids that um, just got to – some that got to touch the NBA and some that are still in the NBA right now um, that's from that experience back then. And now he may, you know, coaching in the NBA, gets to see a lot of these guys who, you know, we had them as, as young bucks. So it's just a different – like even Tobias Harris that he coaches – there in Philly, when we're in Peach Jam back in 2009 with our I-5 Elite team, he's with City Rocks. This dude wants to hang out with our team the whole time. You know, he's with us in the pool. He's going to Waffle House with us and all that. Um, so, yeah, that that kind of is what got me into it. And then just since then, I've, I've been a crazy junkie about it. I've coached at the high school level. I've coached at the, the JUCO level. Um, I guess I've done AAU basketball. Um, I even for about six months worked with Antonio Harvey, um, you know, coaching with the ABA when he was the general manager, but with a team called the Portland Rain. So, I mean, and then being around the Blazers practice facility, I got had all access to all the coaches. So, I mean, I feel like I've just, I've touched every single level. My best friend played in the DG League, which was a D League at the time for, you know, like three to four years. I mean, I, I get, I've got to see it all around guys playing overseas, um, which to me helps give me like a holistic view of how to develop players and, uh, and know their journey. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and now you're into uh, more of the skill development side of things. That's kind of where your, your, uh, your footprint is in, uh, is right now. Am I correct in saying that? Yeah, no, I, and that's where I started. And as you get going on, you know, the AAU gets the more of the attachment, all stuff. But that's I start when I started in 2002. That's why I started doing skill development. I would say now more focusing with skill development on IQ development. I see. Um, okay. Something that I think is really just uh, negated. It's not. It's not taught as much as it should be. Uh, I believe it's the software to the computer. The body's the hardware, and and the basketball IQ to mind is the software. You know, you think about a computer, you can have the nicest computer on the outside and have poor software. And you can have a, a terrible looking computer on the outside that has a remarkable piece of software on the inside that can you know, do a lot of stuff. So that's the way I look at the game of basketball, basketball IQ. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll get into uh, uh, more trends in player development a little bit later. Um, but, uh, you know, we're here when I host the podcast, I'm just a little bit outside, you know, of, uh, of Toronto, Canada. Uh, so, you know, the basketball scene here has really developed since 2013, 2014, when, you know, Kyle Lowry came onto the scene. I mean, a lot of what Toronto was, was a hockey city, right? It was Leafs town and it's, and it's still to an extent, a Leafs hockey type city, but more so now than ever, it's been a basketball city. And that's really started, you know, since 2013, 2014 with the, the pairing of Lowry and DeRozan uh, and then uh, the, the leadership of Masai Ujiri from Dwayne Casey and onwards. And uh, we've really started to develop that. But, you know, one of the things that I wanted to t uh, talk to you about is what's the basketball scene like there in Portland? Because, you know, and you know about the Oregon Ducks, you know about, you know, the Portland Trailblazers. But outside of that, you know, somebody from the outside looking in probably really doesn't know much other than the fact that, you know, the Adidas and the Nike headquarters are there. And that might be, you know, the extent of the, the knowledge they have about Portland, Oregon. So talk to me a little bit about what uh, the Portland basketball scene is and uh, if that has affected you at all, especially, you know, uh, going up there and stuff like that, which I'm sure it has. Man, heck yeah. That's the whole reason why, I, you know, I do what I do. You know, I came into this, I was, I love baseball. And when I 
first got integrated into basketball in the, around eighth grade, you know, like real basketball, um, authentic basketball, it just really opened my eyes and grabbed me. Um, we, we have a really rich basketball history and culture here, even though we're a small basketball community. And also, um, you know, not to belittle that, because of Nike and Adidas headquarters being here, we get the opportunities for a lot of stuff to come to our city that doesn't come to any of the other cities in the United States because mm -hmm. of those things are here. So, um, and not everything is broadcasted. I mean, there could be a situation where LeBron, um, KD, you know, Kyrie and somebody else comes out here for their Nike obligations. And then they do some impromptu workout at the coach K facility that's out on campus or that nobody else on earth would know about, except if you live in Portland, Oregon, they'd be like, and you know, one of our Nike reps would go, Hey, you know, you're out here. If you want to come by and watch these guys work out or uh, things like that. So we have access to that type of stuff, but um, there's a guy here to connect things to Toronto. You know, you know, the person who's the rookie of the year that started your inaugural um, organization is a guy by the David name of David Stoudemire. Stoudemire, who's from Portland, Oregon. Mighty Mouse, that's right. He's from Portland, Oregon. No, it's not like he just came skated. This is where he's born and raised from here. So he, you know, he was a 1990, I believe, graduate from Wilson High School, which is in the PIL, the Portland Interscholastic League. I went to Jefferson High School in Cleveland. That's in the Portland Interscholastic League. So, you know, uh, Wilson at the time when – uh, Damon was right. I believe he won three state championships. You know, he was, was really ballyhooed. He goes on to Arizona. And so these are the seeds that get planted in our city that all the players that are watching get to see like, wow, um, Damon and go on. But just before Damon was a guy named Terrell Brandon, um, who at one time was named, uh, you know, looked at as the best point guard in the entire NBA. You know, they're arguing, is it him or John Stockton type of thing mm. when he played with the Cleveland Cavaliers and then went to the uh, Minnesota Timberwolves. So we've had players like that throughout the years, you know, at least in around my era, that planted seeds that helped um, start paving the way. And then you, you move on after that and you start having some of the Kevin Loves and the Terrence Jones and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, skill development in terms of what we do, like basketball training, I can remember that being done here in Portland in the late eighties and the early nineties, um, that wasn't being done around the United States that often like that. That mm -hmm. wasn't that prevalent like that. It, you got to understand it. I know that it seems like, Oh man, I might came from LA or that wasn't like that. People didn't, they might've went and played pickup, but in terms of pulling five or six players off the court, Hey, no, no, no. Just dribble with your left hand. Don't do nothing. Protect your left hand, get your eyes up. Um, so we had guys around our community that were doing it. Back then it was a guy by the name of Howard Avery that did stuff. Um, you had our, that organization, Self Enhancement, that also um, – there was an inner city community uh, organization that put on camps. You know, the SEI camp was a free camp where all the people in the city could come to and they gave you a free pair of shoes from Nike because hmm. uh, it was a nonprofit organization. So this is a camp that still goes on. It's not the same as it used to be in terms – of uh, just how gritty and authentic it used to be. Things have you know, got a little shiny and stuff now, but uh, these are the things that help tons of people in our community. I know without SEI camp and all these different things and, and Damon making it, you're not looking at Ime Yudoka coaching for the Spurs and playing in the NBA and coaching for the 76ers and stuff. So, um, yeah, I believe we got a really rich uh, history of, of basketball here and rich culture and, um, I'm extremely prideful about it. That's like the primary thing that gets me up outside my love for basketball is that I really want to see our community get noticed. I want to see our players in our community get noticed. I don't want to see the, these big cities that I believe we got just as much as they have uh, there. So Absolutely. it drives a lot of what I do. So it's, uh, it's kind of like a, a, a small, you, you know, an underdog mentality, a lot from a lot how you came from, I guess that kind of ties back, right? It's kind of the chip on your shoulder, you know, type of idea where, you know, we're not the big LA, we're not the big New York city, but you know, that doesn't matter. It's not, that doesn't mean we can't produce talent. That doesn't mean we don't have the talent to produce talent uh, in a sense. And yeah, I, I totally understand that. And, you know, kind of moving on from that now we're in a situation with coronavirus and COVID-19 where we've, we're kind of experiencing something that I don't think anybody's ever going to see again in their lifetime uh, from a basketball standpoint. I mean, you just look at the NBA 
I mean, it doesn't take much to see how different things are. Uh, but again, taking this back to your perspective, now we're, we're in a situation where, you know, college players, high school players, AAU players, they've got to do something to get noticed because their life doesn't stop. They still got goals to achieve. They still got places they want to go. And just because there's a pandemic that hits doesn't mean that their goals, you know, stop in any way. So what, what do you, uh, what do you see as a way for, you know, some of these players and uh, in, in all these levels to kind of do what they can to get noticed? And if you could, just because, you know, we're in Canada, can you describe uh, what AAU is? Cause some, a lot of people don't actually know what that is, especially with the scene in Canada here. I'm sure we have our own version of it, but just for uh, the purposes of uh, kind of getting some context, that would be uh, helpful too. Yeah. It's AAU is like, um, you know, after the high school basketball season, travel basketball, where, um, some of the best players from that area, not necessarily from one team. It might be, you know, if there's 10 high schools, one, the best player from each of those high schools get put on a team or from that area and then go play against, uh, AAU is no longer like a United States thing. Now, like teams from Canada come Australia, right. all it's, it's kind of a global thing now. So, but it's primarily played in the United States where teams will come from all over to do that. So, uh, and college coaches, will come to these tournaments to come recruit and that it's become a recruiting um, hub or hotbed for college coaches to find talent. Um, well, now, you know, the NCAA has, I don't know about the rules in, in Canada, but the NCAA that governs all of college in the United States has stated that no college coaches can come view any players until August 31st. And that's just the date tentatively for them to revisit things again. And they've continued right. to push that date back since April. So my opinion is that, and it has been since way back in March when people are asking me is that you got to control what you can control right now. Um, you know, so if you're in college basketball, if you are a high school player or if you're playing in AAU, the number one thing that you can control, you know, cause they're kind of displaced right now. It's like being kicked out of your house. And like, where are you going to go? <laughs> uh, well, what do you know? You know, don't think about all the things you don't know. What do you know? Okay, I can work on my game. Get better. That's the one thing that I think any player that's on this earth can, can control is developing to get better. And you also got to kind of back that up a little bit, make sure that you're working on the right things to do. But you can control that. And then if you are a high school and an AAU player, your whole mindset's about recruiting. How can I get into college? Um, you can't play in front of any coaches right now. So um, – it doesn't make sense to go play AAU. You got some people who are playing AAU because all oh, those streaming and whatnot, you know, I think some of the streams might not be the best quality. So they're not going to see your best depiction of you. And you haven't played in five months, four to five months. Right. Uh, competitively. So I, there's kids that are getting offers right now without playing AAU. So it's almost like you play on the coach's mindset. They don't, they can't see all the information. So they have to start making decisions on the information that they have. I would say for, for high school players and AAU players, bombard college coaches with calls, emails, and, and texts if you got their information. But if not, emails and phone calls and sending your information over, game film, uh, you know, articulating a little bit about yourself, uh, being able to open up and talk more. In this day and age, kids, you know, if you uh, are young fellas, young players, young girls, if you send them a message and they're going to hi, yeah, cool. It's, you know, it's one-liners and stuff open up and say a paragraph. You know, I think that's something that will uh, draw a coach into a player because mm -hmm. they're not used to them speaking like that. And then if you're in college, the main thing is, is just, you got to work on getting better. That's what you can control right now. There's no, I mean, unless you're planning to transfer, then you're going to have to co contact college coaches on your own behalf. But outside of that, it's just control what you can control. And the two things I think any player on this, I don't care if you're in the NBA, WNBA down to, you know, bitty ball, if you're, you know, first grade, you should be focusing on being in peak condition, your conditioning, and enhancing your basketball IQ during this, this period of time. Because uh, I think those are two things that control the game of basketball. And I think those are two things that are um, omitted or not worked on as much in basketball, which is like ironic. Uh, right. Right. So it'd be saying like, hey, we're going to build a house. Well, the most important thing, we got to build a foundation and a roof. And it's like, oh, let's build a pool and let's build, you know, some swing sets outside. It's like, okay, well, then you're not going to have a house, you know? So right. uh, those are the, it, 
you have to back up and get more simple during this time. There's so many questions that can't be answered. So you just have to answer the questions that can be answered. For, absolutely. And, uh, you know, going back to your, you know, I, I like that uh, analogy of building the foundation and they want to build a pool. The way that I guess I would use that is like the kids, they want to work on, you know, the step back threes and they, they don't know, they don't know how to set up a back cut to go back door when they Come don't on. have, when they're not playing without the ball. Like yeah. that is that that's going to be so much more important for you than to work on that step back three, which, you know, if you don't make a coach is probably going to take you out of the game anyway, especially if it's not shot in the right situation. So I I'm totally on board uh, with you when you, when you talk about that. And that kind of leads me into what I wanted to talk about next was, and I guess basketball IQ kind of falls into this is like, what are the trends in like player development? Like what needs more attention? What needs less attention? And I guess you can kind of, uh, kind of expand on what you were talking about with, you know, basketball IQ being probably at the top of that list of the things that need more attention, because I think uh, I saw a, a thing uh, with Sam Mitchell at, a, at, an, at an Adidas camp. And, you know, there was a kid that drove, uh, you know, into a, a, a you know, a body of players. And he, and he basically said, you guys got to learn how to play without the ball. He's like, if you go to Houston, you think they're going to give uh, you the ball instead of James Harden. If you go to mm -hmm. OKC, they're going to give you the ball instead of Chris Paul. You're going to give Trey, you're going to, do you think Trey Young is going to give the ball up to you? And he's talking real facts. Like those guys are at the top of their levels. And the reason that they got there is because that they're one of those rare players and not to say that you can't get there, but if you don't learn to play, you know, without the basketball and have those basketball IQ fundamentals, you're not going to see the court. And a lot of those guys, you know, Harden, Trey Young and Chris Paul probably had to learn to play without the basketball before they've learned to play with the basketball as well. So uh, talk a little bit about that. And, you know, the other, uh, you know, aspects of basketball IQ, which is not just playing without the basketball, but, you know, understanding the game offensively, you know, and defensively as well. Yeah, man. First of all, I, I rock with anything Sam Mitchell's talking about. He, that's what I call authentic coaching. He's a person that's authentic to the game of basketball. There's no fluff in that. You know, I've seen a little video one time. I think it might even been attached to that. I believe it was at Adidas Nations. And uh, he's coaching the team. He got a bunch of names like, you know, Zion type names, guys like right. that that are there that are, you know, all top level talented, but they don't know how to. I want to be able to articulate this the right way. Like I'm learning Spanish right now um, from a teacher in Spain. Uh, I do what we're doing right now on Skype twice a week, Spanish. Um, I want to know Spanish. I don't know Spanish. I can't throw the teacher some ideas. I can't try to, I have to humble myself. I have to shut my mouth and I have to take notes. And look, ironically, man, I got my notes right here, like right by this, I got to take my notes right there. That's um, how you do it. And so you find so many players that have this mindset that like, because they've got notoriety that they know. And if you're going up levels, you know, you knew at high school, you knew it. Once you go to college, you don't know as much. Even if you average 20 points, there's still a lot of stuff that you don't know that's to the naked eye that, oh, he's averaging 20 and he's horrible on defense. He misses defense assignments. He doesn't box out. He doesn't get back on defense well. Like all these are, are, you won't notice these unless you have a trained eye or you watch a lot of basketball. That's right. You know, um, a, a, a point right here, you know, prayers up to, to, to Nurk's grandma and what's going on. Absolutely. But the other day, I know that Nurk will say this about himself, as talented as Nurk is, when they were playing Brooklyn Nets the other day, Jared Allen, who I believe is a younger player than him, got six to seven offensive rebounds in the last five minutes of the game. Um, no matter how talented he is, that player has to learn you have to box out. It, mm -hmm. it's, it's, there's nothing fluffy or nice or fancy that you can say to him. There's nothing you pull him aside, or you might have to pull that talented player off the court. And that's to me, is how really good players, to me, get better, um, is you got to challenge them like that. And that's something that's not happening as much in today's day and age. But the basketball IQ – I think is is something that's atrophied in the game of basketball. Um, and that's why you see there's, you know, John Morant gets a lot of attention the way he does because he's such a smart player. Mm -hmm. He's not the biggest muscular guy. He's not the, you know, he has athleticism and whatnot, but um, it, it's players like that that are really going to move the needle again. Look at Draymond Green. Um, he just team. did a, a little video the other day where he was talking about a play that Gary Trent did and um, I think it, like a, a reporter ran when it was like, yeah, yeah, he made the shot. He's like, no, hold up. He had to explain the whole play. He's like, I don't even talk about the shot. Like, 
that's to the average fan you see that. I was taught about how he fought over the screen and he thought it was a switch and he bumped back to the roller and got the steal on the roll. That's Those are instincts. But if you don't know the game of basketball, that would have just went right by your face and then you would have saw some step back three and you would have, hey, look at that play right there. It's all those ones that lead up to that and players today – they just don't understand that systematic process. I don't want to group every player in there. I mean, there's obviously exceptions to the rule. But if I was a player in today's age and age, I would be listening to some of the coaches saying this because if you do grasp it, you're going to be light years ahead of the players in today's day and age because I don't think anybody that's on their radar to go, I want to become a smarter player. Right. Damian Lillard is destroying the NBA right now. And if he was on this podcast right now, I would say, Damian, Please, please just tell me, um, did you watch a lot of game film during uh, the COVID? He said, yeah, that's all I was doing. I said, I can see it. The way you're making reads on your pick and rolls, it's like the game is slower. I can see it. It looks like a game. He'd be like, it's like gaping holes. I'm speaking for him right now, but I bet you that's what he would say. And then another thing I say, I say, dang, did you put a lot of effort into your conditioning during the COVID, during the uh, pandemic, you know, the, the quarantine? He would say, yeah, how did you know I was doing? That's all I was doing. So going back to my point earlier, the two most important things I believe in the game of basketball are conditioning and basketball IQ. And look at how, and now you go, well, you got to have skill. You get, yes. Yes, you do. But I can back up to a player like a Dennis Rodman and show you how conditioning and, and, and basketball IQ dominated the game. Now, how many players have that low of skill? Yeah. Not any. And in today's day and age, most have skill. They aren't, they're not conditioned. Absolutely. Yeah, you make, you make a really good point. And just going back to the Damian Lillard thing, I saw him on uh, J.J. Riddick's podcast, and, you know, you're, you're right on the money. That's, all, that's what he talks about. He's like, he's like, if we don't play that day, I, he's like, I don't miss a game on League Pass. He's like, I, I watch these. like, I'll watch Atlanta versus Detroit with six games left in the regular season. Like, <laughs> like that's the level he goes to because he always feels like he has, you know, something to learn. And, you know, we're going to talk a little about what makes Dame so dominant later in this podcast because I think he's probably the, the – entire topic of basketball around the world right now given what he's doing it's it's kind of insane um but i just want to throw one more back what do you what do you think is getting too much attention uh in oh. terms of uh player development like what are what are players working on you know not to saying that something that they're working on isn't going to be valuable because if you're putting in work uh you know it's uh, it's obviously going to translate one way or the other but i think you can also be working on stuff that might not be conducive to you getting better in games and in situations that matter um, can you think of anything specific that players are yeah. working on that's like, you know, maybe your time could be used a little bit better elsewhere? Yes. One-on-one -on -one moves, ball handling, and shooting. And, and uh, just listen to this. It's prevalent. It's too much. It's too, it's too much. You know what I mean? It, it, look, at, look at a player like Gary Trent Jr. Okay. I bet when he goes and works out, he's going to do some ball handling and attack moves. And he's going to get his shots up. And, you know, he might do some step backs. But then when he gets on the floor with Portland Trailblazers, C.J. McCollum and Damian Lillard are going to be having the ball in their hands 99.2% of the time. So you got to learn how to space out, how to cut through, how to screen, how to do these other things. Um, so, and even going to the point right now, going to the quarantine or the pandemic, throughout our whole basketball career, these are things that you've been working on ball handling. You've been doing that. I think it would be just nice to push pause on that stuff because you're going to always do it. And then look at what, what do I just never work on a uh, rebounding, man, today I'm going to do four rebounding drills instead of my normal shooting routine and stuff. But I think that ball handling uh, uh, attack moves and, and shooting are just, and those are easy to do. Like you go into you know, if I want to become a development coach or a trainer, wherever you want to call them, like it's easy for me to go on YouTube, you know, look at seven, 10 videos or whatever, get some drills, get a bag of cones, come to the court and then do that. It's harder for me to teach how to defend screens with a group of players. It's right. harder for me to teach defensive positioning and rebounding and how to anticipate the flight of the ball, read where the ball is going to go and articulate this stuff and have a voice to teach it to them. All that stuff's hard. You have to learn it. So that's why you have so many coaches that are teaching ball handling and shooting. And those are the sexy 
parts of the game. That's what gets noticed, you know, like uh, you can see Draymond Green's greatness in, in terms of what he does intangibly on the floor, but that doesn't get represented in the statistics. So then there's a narrative supporting that, you know what I mean? Like, oh, well, he's not this and he's not that. And it's like, well, there's all these great things that he does that we can't support in statistics. So then we just don't talk about it. Right. Except the nerds about basketball will talk about it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So. And, you know, I and I want to be clear, I, I don't think that you're saying that those skills aren't important because obviously those yes. are a foundation of a basketball oh, no. player. You're not saying that they're not important, but you're just what I think what you're just saying is, look, maybe you you skip a shooting session and, you know, learn a little bit more about how what it means to you know, be a decision maker in four on three with, with, with screen and roll situations or uh, what moves you can use to attack a closeout. And when that secondary defender comes up, what are the reads that you make to make a pass? That sort of stuff. Not to saying that those other skills that you talked about aren't important, but there are so many other game situation type skills that could you could benefit so much from just by spending a few extra sessions working on. And so I, I just don't want to misconstrue your words by yeah. saying, you know, dribbling yeah, no, and shooting exactly. are not important because that's, that's what people are going to take out of that, right? Yeah, like, come on. I, I've made, you know, 15 threes in the game. I love three-point shots. Absolutely. I want to be all that good stuff. But I think all coaches, because that's a big part of this deal. Sure. Players learn from coaches. All coaches and all players have to ask themselves, without getting information from somebody else to start to formulate your own thoughts. What really are the most important things in the game? What really, if I'm a player, what really are the most, I know that I've been doing ball handling, shooting in this normal routine, but is this really the most important? Like when I'm watching the game and I'm seeing Jared Allen get those offensive rebounds and give his team a chance to stay in the game mm -hmm. and he's not shooting threes and doing stuff like, Okay, I, I might have to make some notes on this. Take some notes on that. Okay, dang. Kyle Lowry doesn't look the most muscular. He doesn't jump high. I've never seen a dunk, but he leads the NBA in charges. Okay, hold up here. I don't know. I don't really like taking charges. I'm torn. You know what? You see what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I don't, definitely. I mean, yeah, I, I no, just you're think speaking you facts. You're speaking facts. I, I mean, I had to do this for myself as a coach. This is how I'm, this is how I'm coming to this type of thinking. Um, you know, when I was 25 to 27 or whatever, I did ball handling drills and shooting drills and all that stuff. I, I get it. And I still do to this day. But if we're looking at a pie chart of what I teach now, I tell you, there's some weeks that our guys don't do ball handling. And if I say, hey, we're going to do some ball handling, put the ball on the floor and palm it, pick it up, palm it, palm it, palm it. Now you go, what is that? The use of that developmentally. Why don't you watch the NBA? What players aren't palming the ball? What what Tyler Eulis isn't palming the ball? What little to big guy is not palming the ball out there? I'm just right. going to wait for you to ask, answer that. Everybody yeah. is. Exactly. That shows how you control the ball. You know, I watched Nurch last night. After he got a foul, he just grabbed the ball off the floor and popped it to the referee. If you see the guy get it in post, he pal palms it. Uh, I watched, who was it? Who, 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 it was a game yesterday. Oh, it looked nice. Ben Simmons. Uh, no, no, not Ben Simmons. Uh, uh, Slow-mo. Slow-mo. Who were they Kyle playing? Anderson. Who were they? Who were they playing the other day? Uh, Kyle, it was, uh, the, Blazers. It was the Blazers. Yeah, they're playing the Blazers. And he, and I was watching the replay last night, and he remember they went up fourteen, and then they brought the the bench crew in, and yeah. Kyle Anderson single handedly ran like eight um, pop back pick and rolls and came off the top and made the perfect read on it. And one time he went to the hole like he was going to shoot it. He had the ball palm like this, and then he dropped it down to the player. I don't know if you Valen recognize Judas. that. Oh, I remember. I, I tweeted it out on Twitter. That was a fantastic pass. Just the, the ball manipulation he was able to use to look like oh, he's going to the rim and then throw it right down. Perfect dime to Valanciunas. He did that a couple times. I saw that. So That's listen right. to what we're talking about right now. This is what I teach our players. If you're seven years old to – to the pro that comes in to work with me, I teach them how to palm the ball because I believe that's how you control the ball in dribbling, passing, shooting, catching, rebounding, and it gives you confidence too. And that's how you hold the ball when you're shooting the ball. You just don't squeeze it like that, but that's how the ball's in your hands. Right. So ask them. These guys are – James Harden's gripping and palming the ball and shooting, and that's why he shoots so well. These are just little secrets to the game that, that people don't know, but – that play, you understand it now because Kyle Lowry didn't just have the ball in his hands and pass it. He palmed the ball, and because he had a palm, you believe he was going to shoot it, and then yeah. you just dropped it down easy to control it. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, oh. Kyle Kyle Anderson was uh, was crucial off the bench uh, the other night. I I'll, I'll give it to you. He was, you know, that's that that's one of those guys where you know not a lot of athleticism, not a lot of lot not a lot of speed, but damn, he just understands how to play the game, and that's just kind of a perfect example of what you're talking about there. Is a guy like Kyle Anderson. So I I appreciate that example because I I totally agree there, and. Um, you know, you talk a lot about, you know, you know, palming the ball and, you know, things, uh, you know, things of that nature, the, the kind of little dark arts of uh, skills, I would guess I would call it, you know, to the game. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, trainers out there that, uh, you know, are kind of teaching some, some questionable things, we'll call it, you know, and, uh, you know, has a, gimmickry. sorry? Gimmickry. Gimmickry. That's a good way to, they got a lot of moves. They got a lot of one-on-one -on -one moves. They got a lot of ways to get to the rim. They, they can, they can definitely beat you one-on-one. -on -one. But when it's, when, it tie, when it gets time to come into a game and play five on five, and everyone is just as good as they are, well, you're, you're, they're getting lost, you know, pretty quickly, pretty damn quickly. So I mean, I, I'm sure you've seen that in the United States. Like, I'm sure there are those trainers out there. They're all over Instagram and you know Twitter and stuff like that. And you, you've got a bunch of a bunch of legit guys out there too that I follow. Like guys like you know Tyler Ralph, DJ Sackman. Uh, uh, Drew Hanlon is one of my personal favorites. And, uh, you know, there's guys that goes on. Mark Edwards is another great one. Guys that go on and on that really, really, you know, know and understand the game and have had their clients, you know, really come out and, you know, do great things. And there's some others that are, you know, mentoring the youth in perhaps uh, an interesting way, we'll call it gimmicky way, I guess. Can you speak to any of that and any, uh, any of that that you've seen over the years? And uh, I'm guessing you've learned a lot uh, from that as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I learned what to do and some from people I learned what not to do as well. But, you know, I, I consider myself somebody who's authentic to the game. I want to know um, the past of the game. I want to know what's current. I want to hopefully get to start to know the future and, and where the game's going to go. And so when you talk about knowing the, the history of the game and the past of the game, there's a thread that always goes through anything, I believe, no matter what it is. And so we're, we're getting away from that thread with the way the game's being developed now because of the mediums of social media and YouTube and video and that stuff, it can get pumped Hi, out so quickly. Highlight culture, I guess. Is what Highlight. I yeah. 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 Highlight culture. And you know, I mean, we had highlights when I was growing up in the nineties in high school and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I will say that, you know, we prided ourselves on like knowing the game, wanting to know the game. Um, because I believe once you get to that standpoint, that's, these are all your coaches and the different people who continue to stay around the game. If you, your foundation of the game, how you're learning the game is the right way, you give yourself an opportunity to stay around the game. It doesn't have to just be your playing career. And that's how it is for most people. And I don't, man, I want to break down these gimmick trainers, stammer trainer, whatever you want to call them. Like, uh, you know, you would like to think, man, maybe these guys haven't played before if they're taking this perspective. But then you got some guys like, no, nah, I played D1. I did this. And it's like, well, why? Why are you taking that perspective? Because you're you're taking this information and you're pumping it out to a large amount of kids and players. And whether if it's accurate or not, they a lot of them are going to follow that. And so with the information I, I do, I try not to just pull something out and just start teaching it. I really take it back with myself and start kind of scrutinizing. I'll, I'll, I'll do a think tank with, I'll ask other coaches like in the NBA, WNBA around that. I, and then, get it to a point and then boom, I've, I've already troubleshooted it. I've seen all the errors or non errors in it. And, and then I can put it forward where I believe this can really help the game, not just for this group of players or whatever. And every group of players is different. You know, like the analogy I just gave with Gary Trent Jr. If I have a group of players, one player in that group might be the one on their team that handles the ball a lot. And the other say eight or nine players won't. So that if we did ball handling the whole time, yes, that does, in essence, help their game uh, develop. But if they don't handle the ball in the game, then I don't think it helps them develop. What's one, what's uh, something that everybody has to do in a game? You have to defend. What's something that everybody has to do in a game? Off the ball, you need to know how to space. Off the ball, you need to know how to cut. Off the ball, you need to know how to screen. These are things I believe maybe 80 to 90% of players don't really know how to do. Um, and you, I can watch it in NBA games. That's what I'm saying. I would look at it and go, that guy could just drop down two steps to the corner and will, it will make the world of difference on that floor. But he is so anxious to get the ball. So he doesn't get in a deep corner. He lifts up a little bit just so that everybody can see him. You know what I mean? But it's like, 
you're now impeding the driver's um, progress to drive to the basket, which then is going to impede your progress to receive the ball. If you drop down and get away a little longer, you're going to help that person drive deeper, which then your man's going to help later. And ultimately, you're going to be the one that's going to get the benefit of that play. But we could do this on and on and on and on and on with different scenarios in the game that I don't think get talked about a lot. You know, you got, you got to be, a, I just say, you got to be a nerd for the game, man. And you said earlier, you know, being humble, hey, I do this and that. The same process that you do, that's what I do. I watch games. I listen to podcasts. I, I look at other people that I can, I respect or go, hey, you know, I like what they're talking about. Um, so there's no different. There's no, you know, if you are, you would find out if you sat down and talked to Popovich, he would be like, oh, I do that same stuff too. Right. So then what? What are we talking about? You know, he, and he's looked at as one of the best in the business. You don't want to look at it like that. We're all in the same boat. I look at myself like a beginner, and that's what helps me learn every day. A lot of these yahoos get out here and they, you know, they start drinking the Kool-Aid and start feeling themselves, and that's part of what social media is. Um, if you see the stuff I'm posting, you really ain't going to probably see my face or something, man. It's like I'm, I'm a ghost trainer or something. Uh, I mean, if somebody <coughs> does it, but I'm not going to be in there with the, fid, the phone myself like, hey, yeah, let's go. It, it just – and I'm not doing – we're not going to have some video person in there doing all this – glamorous videos because that's not the game right i think if you want to get that make it to the damn nba or college basketball or wnba um or olympics or something they'll have some great highlights for you you don't you don't have to have a, a video editor person do that for you sit in the gym what's wrong with going for three months without po one post and then you come back and they're like what the hell have you been doing mm -hmm. but everybody's got it every day you got to let them see it every day you know if you worked out on your own, lifting weights, eating good, and you try to look in the mirror every day, you're not going to see no damn progress. No. If you just do your stuff, and then one day you kind of start looking at you, be, yo, what's going on, man? I'm kind of looking cut here. <laughs> you got to get lost in the work. Right. And you can't be looking every day at the progress, you know. Um, if I got a haircut yesterday, did something go back? Let me get him. It's like, chill out, man. Give it a day or two. You get a haircut, you know, or line it up. But you got to let the process, you got to dive into the process and do the work and get lost in the process. And then that's when you will start to see the progress. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, a lot of what compounds the problem is the fact, yeah, you talk about it a lot is like the, the consistent posting of, you know, these highlights and these crazy two, two ball, three ball drills and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, it, and, and it makes, and it makes for good content, right? It makes for great content. It's, it's, it's great to see on house of highlights and bleacher report and all this stuff, but it's just compounding the problem because they're not going to actually, they're, they're not going to show the way that you sealed your man after the screen and roll and was able to, <laughs> you know, pass to the corner corner and then relocate back out to three yeah. and knock down the shot with good footwork and good form. Like that just doesn't get the clicks. It doesn't get the likes. It doesn't get the attention that it should when in reality, that's what the game is. You're not, you, there's only one basketball on the court. Those two oh, ball man. drills are, are, aren't going to help you. Uh, especially if you've got a main ball handler on your team and you're just uh, you know, you're just a spot up, you know, three and D shooter. And, you know, even, even having self-awareness about the type of player that you are is so important. I find, you know, as well. And not to say that you can improve and get better at things, but understanding who you are and, you know, what you want to become is also such a crucial point of that. And I think that they get, you know, a lot of players probably get lost in the highlight culture and say, damn, I want to be that. I want to be that. And they just realize like, Hey, look, man, what you can do might not be on that highlight, but that doesn't mean that it's not valuable to your team and to the game. So, you know, understand that. And that's probably where, you know, uh, player coach communication comes in as well, where you can just go to your coach and be like, Hey coach, why am I on the floor? You know what I mean? What do, what do I do? Well, like, what do you, like, what are we, why am I out there for these minutes? And maybe I'm not necessarily closing the games, but I'm starting the games or I'm with the second unit. Like talk to me a bit, a bit about what I'm good at and what I need to get better at. And I think that's probably something a lot of players aren't necessarily doing because they're too wrapped up in seeing what makes the highlights, uh, you know, on Instagram and just trying to replicate that sort of thing. That's, that's just my opinion anyway, from the outside yeah. looking in. No, nah, what you said, I think you just hit on a genius point for players. And even coaches got to do this. But um, find, like, have some self-awareness and find out who, who are you? What type of player are you? What do you do well? And what do you not do well? We can't just keep talking about, like, hey, yeah, man, I shoot three and I can do this. And man, I don't care who you are. Everybody doesn't do everything. Do you have some strengths and you have some weaknesses? And the quicker that you can 
find those out. And if you really want to perform at a high level in games, you have to do what you do well and stay away from what you don't do well, period. On your spare time, you work on what you don't do well so that hopefully at some point in time here in the near future, I could bring it into the games and that'd be one of the things I do well. But I don't ever want to show you what I don't do well. I don't even want you to, I want you to speculate that I might even be able to do it well, but I'm just not doing it. Um, <laughs> and I heard that from an agent. And this was around 2011, 12, when I had a player, Mike Moser, uh, who was on some draft boards and whatnot and getting an opportunity to go. And he was saying to him, he was like, you know, you got an opportunity right now where he can uh, take advantage of this. And if he's able to get in here, he'll get in and show, you know, he has weaknesses, but if he can stay in this box, he can be able to play where they won't know his weaknesses. And once he gets in the NBA, then they'll figure him out, but he'll be in the NBA figuring out his weaknesses. You show him in college, you won't get to the NBA because now the evaluation is he can't do this. Mm -hmm. So having some humility, that's what I'm saying. Like that, that point that you just said could make a person or break a person. It could take you to your ultimate dream if you're able to have that humility. And that's the hardest thing, I think, for all these players today. Does humility go with posting yourself every day? It's a great question. Well, I think there's a term for that. When, they, when somebody takes pictures and does videos and stuff for that, they, I've heard that's called narcissistic. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, I, and I'm not the smartest person, and I don't, yeah, I don't know all these definitions and stuff. I just, that's what I've heard. Um, but I think it starts to talk about who you believe yourself is if you got to keep showing everybody what you're doing and who you are and what you look like and what new stuff you got and what area of the world you're in and what type of food you eat. And look at this plate. You like that plate? Don't right. you know when you're sending the picture of that plate, the food's getting cold, you know? Um, but this is the world we live in today. Um, you know? Yeah, and absolutely. And it's crazy how it crosses over into basketball. So, uh, so seamlessly, right. Is that every, everything that we're talking about applies to everyday life as much as it does, you know, to basketball, whether it's, you know, the narcissism you talked about, the self-awareness, like it's that, and that's why we love the game, right. Because not only does basketball, you know, is it's an escape for a lot of people, it's a hobby, but it's also so many lessons of the game you can take into everyday life. And I think that that's probably one of the, the underlying things that uh, people don't realize they love about the game, but, understand that when it's all done it's like damn like i learned how to communicate work with people how to push the right buttons face adversity all these things that just transfer over into everyday life that you just kind of don't realize until i don't want to say it's too late but i guess until you're finished and uh I, I think some players would benefit a lot from realizing that uh you know that sort of concept earlier you know in their careers in my opinion got it it's humility that's like the central tenet to to getting that and so if you start feeling yourself you drinking the kool-aid you feeling good you you there's no humility there or the self-awareness like you talked about so you you're gonna get smacked in the face here pretty soon and then there's gonna be a lot of awareness at that point but now you're in a pit and trying to figure out how to get your way out of it and then another problem you said compounding it how many players once they hit adversity know how to deal with adversity because they never had dealt with it before because they've been being coddled or taught how you know told how good they are and that they, everything's fine and dandy and so a big part of it goes into us coaches and and I love players that I work with but I you're not my peer and I'm not your friend and you're not even my peer group so um it's not about us being buddy buddy I've got information that that I know that you don't know and I want to give it to you freely so that you can take it and, and be bigger and better from it um, and so the humility that come into to understanding what you got to learn and, and finding that out about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think, I think that's just a, a great topic that we touched on, you know, right there, you know, one of the other things I had on the list to talk to you about is skills that are universally taught, you know, no matter whether you're a one or a five, like tangible or intangible, but I feel like this podcast has kind of been that in we've itself. Been that, yeah. We've been already covering that throughout it. And I think Bass by Q, you know, there's limited skills. Like if I want to say footwork, you know, I think all players need to know how to jump stop. And you go, you were talking about Euro step, step back. These are, that, that's, those are advanced footwork moves. How do you go to that without building the foundation of the jump stop? And then bringing it back to kind of the NBA and whatever on everybody's mind. Like I, if I was able to talk with Damian Lillard right now, I think if he's able to each quarter, just jump stop in the paint four times, each quarter right there for so that 16 times, man, 
th it would significantly make their team better and their team's reads better and whatnot because he can get wherever he wants to go on the floor. But usually if you see him, he's usually going into a finish or he might go off a one and make the play. But rarely do I see him going there and jumps out. And I think it would offer him, you know, a second or two more of decision making, which is like ridiculously long for him. He doesn't even need that much time. But it, it just would offer him additional options. And I say, hey, if you don't see the open guy, shoot, shoot whatever shot you want to shoot in here rather than we had to shoot those ones um, deep three. So that's what I'm saying. I'm taking like four away from those and saying, hey, drive it deep into the paint. But when you get there, just jump stop. Don't, don't already have a, a thought of a shot in your head. Just jump stop and watch how the defense collapses on you. But not a lot of players work on something like, something like that. I just Absolutely. want to show you how that simple thing could reap large dividends from one of the greatest players on earth right now. Totally. And I mean, let's, you know, let's, let's dive right into it. I mean, he is the hottest topic in basketball at the moment. Damian Lillard just absolutely torching the league, put setting the league on fire uh, has really put the Blazers on his back. Uh, and not to say that the contributions from guys like Nurkic and Mello and CJ McCollum and even guys like Gary Trent Jr. have been shooting the ball. Even Mario Hazonia has been given good minutes. All those guys have contributed. But uh, what Damian Lillard is doing is just on an absolutely different level. And, you know, given that he's from Portland, Oregon, he's the hottest, uh, you know, topic on earth. Um, well, let's talk about a little bit what makes Damian Lillard so dominant. And, you know, obviously it's, you know, the, the deep shooting is definitely something that's, you know, crazy, crazy good. But he's also – I think his I think his best ability is to just eat up pick and roll coverages and specifically the drop coverage that teams want to play against him and this is where we get back to that conversation of a lot of guys really don't under like they don't practice this stuff I think one of the things that make Damian Lillard so good is the way he sets up ball screens like I, I think I, I um I can't remember who said this but I think it was um Lawrence Frank of the Clippers, uh, he actually did a whole thing in FIBA on how to, how to use pick and roll, like a, an entire like hour of pick and roll. And I watched it. And he said, your first read is always to beat the guy away, always to beat them away and use and use the ball and don't use the ball screen. And, you know, his ability to shoot obviously makes the defender come up a little bit higher. And because he's, you know, so fast and he's got a great handle, he always a threat to beat him away. And so once he, once you see that, and he and he's a threat, and he just gives you the jab left or the jab right. He comes off tight off that ball screen, and there's no way you're going under on Damian Lillard. So he comes off that ball screen, and now he's got you at his mercy. Because if you trail him too far on his back, he's going to pull up right behind you, and you're going to get a foul. So you have to you have to trail lock and trail just the right amount where you can try to get a good contest on him yeah. or, and obviously not foul. And then as the big in the drop, you have to play high enough to where you can actually get that contest. And if he just decides to give you, hit you with a hesitation and blow by you, now he's sucked in three defenders, the guy trailing him behind him, the big in the drop coverage, and the other guy that has to rotate over the guy. So he's, he's sucking in so many defenders just based on off his ability to set up that one ball screen and come off it and shoot that three. And so that's what I think really goes underrated about Damian Lillard. Yeah, you see the, the logo three-pointers and all that sort of stuff, but it's abil his ability to set up the ball screen, use the ball screen, and then suck the rest of the defenders into him is what's making him so great. And I think this year he's had a career year as a passer, as a playmaker, his assist percentage is all the way through the roof. He's averaging the most assists he's had per game. And that's because uh, he's become such a threat uh, in the pick and roll. I think I saw, uh, I think you actually, I think you liked it where he was averaging 1.31 points per possession in drop coverage in the pick and roll. Like that is just comical. <laughs> that is, yeah, that is just a comical number. So in my opinion, that's obviously there's much more that makes him, you know, a great player, but that's what I've noticed uh, on this tear is just the most more than ever. It's the way he sets up those ball screens and then what he's able to do after he sets you up uh, in terms of drawing different defenders. That's my opinion, but uh, I'd like to, I'd love to hear what you think, uh, uh, as well in terms of what makes Dame so dominating, because truthfully we could do a whole podcast just on this topic, but, yeah. but, but it's, might, uh, it's wild out here. We might have to just depend on how he keep, gets with going with these Lakers. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but for me, like going back to kind of the points, one of the biggest things I think that's like his special superpower um, that is, is hard for other people to see or other um, players in the league to see is that I think it's his humility. Like, I'm going to keep hitting on that point. Talk um, to me. That's right. Just just look at how he cares. Him. Look at how he does all of his interviews, all the stuff. I mean, he's not the rah-rah the guy. I mean, he's 
you know, I'm connected to him on my Instagram page and he's, he's kind of down to earth on there. He's not like he's a, uh, and if somebody's doing all the uh, being negative and whatnot back, he don't even touch that stuff. Like he just, I think it's just not even on his radar, but his humility, I believe he's become a better leader during this time. I, I, who he was before this was still really good. He was humble. He was a leader. He was all that stuff. I think Damian Lillard from the quarantine, like he's one of the few people in the NBA that literally took it all the way serious. And, and like I said, right. got himself into peak condition, the most, best condition he's ever been in his life. And then also I think he really focused on his basketball IQ. Um, you look at his defense right now, that's something that Damon would, Damian would tell you is uh, was a weakness of his, not just something, hey, I need to work on that, a weakness. And that was also being talked about. Look at this. He's getting deflections. He's diving for loose balls. He, Absolutely. like I saw last night on Kyle Anderson, he had got that little uh, offense rebound back, went back up, and he, he stripped it out of there from him, and they went down the hole. I've been – I'm from Portland, Oregon. I've been watching – Blazers and Lillard, he never made those type of plays. So that shows me, man, it's basically he, he's looking at people like, I'm willing to do whatever you need me to do. Right. Um, and at that point, that's where it gets scary because um, that's all he needed to get to. And, and you see it. And so all the areas that I watch him guard screens better. These are the areas that I'm saying, oh, he's got, really got to get better at screens. Like he can't, he can't just die on that screen. He's got to guard it better. And I'm going – Look how Fred Van Vliet guards it. He gets over it there. What's the difference? I mean, you're more athletic than him. And so if Fred Van Vliet can do it every play and if Kyle Lowry can do it every play and if Patrick Beverly can do it, if Damian Lillard does that, he's the MVP. Yeah. I'm not, right. I'm not, no, 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 no. If he does that on the defensive end, because there's nobody that's doing what he can do offensively. You can try to argue it or whatever. He was doing that before the pandemic. He was at 60s. He was doing all that stuff before. He had one of the biggest tears early in the season, he, and he's been doing that over the course of his career, the pulling up from deep, all these different things, mm -hmm. the offensive greatness. I think his pick and roll reads have gotten significantly better, and because of that, that's because of the film I think he watched during this period of time. His reads are better today than they were in March. Absolutely. On the pick and roll. Like, it's, it's not like, oh, they did a little bit better. No, it's like glaring. Um, and so, the, like, one of the main things now I think is that uh, the shot selection in the shot selection. I mean by this going back to that point where I say go downhill and go jump stop in the paint a few more times because you can get that three off. They already know it. They, they know before you play a game that they got to start guarding you at the bus. So it's already in their head. I think, like I said, he puts the pressure on a D think of what's the game where for the first eight, nine possessions, he, he attacked the paint. It was when he started this tier after the Clippers game. What game was that? I think it was against Dallas, but don't quote me on that. I think it was Kristaps Porzingis that he kind of ate up in the pick and roll there, but I could be wrong about that one. I think it was the game before Dallas. Who they played before Dallas? I don't know. Denver, I have to, I'd have to take a look. Denver. Yeah, it might be Denver, yeah. So it was in that game where, no, he just attacked the paint, like nine possessions in a row and either got like a layup or got fouled and once line or dropped it off to somebody. And I was like, oh, hold on. This is different here. And that's what I knew. That was the game after Beverly and them talked that stuff. And then it was his next game. And it was like, I, I got, I have a plan here. Yep. Um, and I'm not saying he didn't ever have a plan before, but it was like very poignant. It was sharp. I could see exactly what he was trying to do. And it was people like Co Kobe, LeBron, Jordan, these are some of the only people throughout the history of the game that I've seen where they just have a sharp plan and stick to it from the start of the game to the end of the game. Because we all got short attention spans. You, know, you could be pumped up and ha have a plan from the beginning, the beginning of the game, and we, we're into the first quarter and somebody's been talking stuff to you, and you're already out of that plan. Right. Lillard's – he's really dialed in, man. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm extremely impressed. Like I said, I – I'm just surprised and excited to keep watching all this stuff because I believe that this is just scratching the surface with what he's doing because of all the work he's put in for those four months prior. It looks great right now. Like he's still got more in his bag um, and, to play and the right a, way. 
and that's the scary part, right? Is yeah. like we like I like he can he can sustain this for eight game stretches. I, I I'm with you. I think that there is a scenario where he can sustain this sustain this for 41 games, 62 games, maybe even all 82 games, and that's that's the scary part. Um, I do agree with uh, your assessment of Lillard defensively. I think he has gotten a lot better. He was definitely a liability okay. earlier in his career, but now I think uh, he also mentioned his work with David Vanderpool really helps him out in terms of being able to recognize uh, specific actions like, uh, yep. like, uh, you know, 35 fist up and, uh, you know, double drag screens are away. So he's already looking for that stuff defensively now before it even gets there. And I, th- and I think that that going back to basketball IQ, that's a perfect example where he's, he's a better defender because he now knows what to prepare for uh, as uh, in terms of before, maybe not so much. So I do agree with that. He's making those hustle plays. He's getting skinny over screens, much like guys like Fred Van Vliet is a great example there. Um, And and I think he's only going to get, you know, better defensively. Now I think that there's also, and you've probably seen this too. There's a, there's a balance there, right? Where you, you, you hold such a heavy offensive load, it's very, very difficult to then match that same energy on the defensive end where you know for 48 minutes a game, you've got to be so mentally you know, locked in uh, to be able to play both ends at such a high level. And that can be, that can be daunting on players. And, you know, that's pro- and that's you, a good example of that would be James Harden. You know what I mean? He, um, do I think James Harden could be a better defender if he didn't have the ball in his hands every possession and every time down? Yeah, I do. I really think he could. I think he could get over a pick and roll every once in a while instead of Houston having to switch every single ball screen. I th- and, and you see it based on his post defense, right? When, he, when you try to post up James Harden, it usually doesn't go too well. You're, he's strong in there. He's, he's really tough. Strong. He's, he's real tough. And I think a lot of his you know, defensive you know, foibles just come from the fact that he's got to save his energy on offense. And I think, you know, Damian Lillard maybe suffered from a little bit of that where he's always been a guy who can defend. It's just how, how much of he, what, we, what he had to shoulder on offense, maybe, uh, you know, kind of t- took a little bit out of him on the defensive end. And there's a, a bunch of players in the league that you could probably give that uh, example to as well. Um, I would agree with that. I think that he took the control back in his hands though, and any player can by being in better condition. Right. If I say that, Good like, point. An example would be if I say, hey, um, you're going to have 100 opportunities, Derek, on the court to play, but I know we're going to put the ball in your hands 50 times, so just do the best you can do in those other 50 because I know we got to get you. That's not how my brain works. So if if there are other smarter people on earth think that, I can't think like that. I think if we're doing 100, I've got to get you in condition to do 100 plays, so 50 on offense and 50 on defense. So I just want to make sure you're ready to do all those plays. Actually, you know what? Let's get you ready for 135 or 125 right. so that you're able to do those and still feel fresh after game. I 100% believe that's what Damian Lillard did. He took the control in his hand and said, hey, I'm on the court. I'm going to play. Why not? Because I'm seeing him make those plays in the fourth quarter when you can't fight fatigue. If you're tired and I have not any capacity, I've not built up my capacity to handle that, once I'm tired, fatigue is winning period right now Lillard can fight fatigue a little bit because he's in condition and that's what you can do you're never going to like beat it up like fatigue is is undefeated from the history of mankind but you can take it on a longer fight uh than than just getting beat up from it right away which is what most people do you know who gets beat up by conditioning right off the bat Joel Embiid how do you know three four plays hits the kneecaps um and you can see it yep Totally. So, like, what's the name yesterday? Like, even Nurk, he's not in the best shape. He needs to get in shape. But yesterday you saw he's moving off the spirit and, you know, the love of the game and the love of his grandma, that that takes you to some different places. But if he's in good condition, that's the type of Nurk that we could see on a consistent basis. But you can't do that. So he's skilled enough. He's iq enough. He's even young. He's like 24, 25. But right. – He's not in condition enough. So I, I could blanket this. If we just took the NBA or the WNBA, you blanket it through everybody. Everybody's skilled enough. You know, people got decent enough intelligence, all this different stuff. They're athletic enough. It's the conditioning. And then the ones who are the great ones, they're in the best condition. And you Absolutely. go like, well, why is he, 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 this guy's better than him. Well, yeah, cosmetically, but he can get more out of himself because he's in condition. Yeah. yeah it's a simple yeah. concept. 
You're, you're totally right. And you, you know, the player that actually comes to mind when I think of that is, is Clay Thompson. Clay Thompson can run all day. Like think about what he has to do on Where offense. He plays from. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Nice little throw. Nice little, uh, well, nice little play there. Yeah. That's, I, that's, I didn't get to train Clay. So I, I'm sidebar and my bad to cut you off. I used to train his older brother, Mikey Thompson, who got a oh. cup of tea in the NBA uh, with the Knicks and with the Cleveland Cavaliers. And he played for the San Jose Warriors. And then Trace is the younger brother under Clay. He plays for the uh, Chicago White Sox organization for baseball. So they got three professional sons. Mm. And I just saw Julie Thompson a week and a half ago at Nectar, which is a little healthy eating spot out here in, uh, here in Portland. So, um, yeah, not to cut you off, but, yeah, Clay's from Portland, big dog. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, he's got that mentality. And, I mean, I wasn't going to go too much further than just think of what, what he does defensively and offensively. You know, he's running – it, it, he's in a warrior system that runs up and down a lot of transition basketball for them. He's, he's running off screens. He's running off curls, even not even just necessarily to get the ball, but just to, you know, have gravity as a, as a shooter that, you know, you, you suck two guys in another guy becomes open uh, that sort of thing. And, you know, defensively he's taken the biggest challenge every single night on the wing, whether it's a one, two, three, or even sometimes a four it's Clay Thompson that's picking up those guys. And so, uh, you know, kind of, I guess, going against my point earlier uh, there, you can do uh, those uh, you can be that guy that takes, uh, you know, the challenge on both ends at an elite level, if you are in peak condition. So I get, I give you credit. That's, yeah. that is a, that is a good example of how that can come to fruition. If, uh, if your conditioning is in the, is in the right shape. When have you ever heard Clay complain? Never. Like, ah, oh, man, it's, I'm just a little fatigued, man. I mean, gosh, you, you see how Rob screens and how – so you see what I'm saying? Like, w- once you get the standard of it, and case in point, you're not hearing Lillard complain or nothing like that. Like, he's Never. doing what he needs to do. Once you get there, it's beautiful when you get in shape. And I I came to this answer by – through myself, because I consider myself a hard worker on something. I had to think and go, you know, how many times throughout your career – I could go back to, like, middle school to – my last college basketball game and go, how many times were you in peak condition? And throughout all that time, maybe three or four. <laughs> and now I'm not talking about the whole damn year. You're talking about like, <laughs> when you're in peak condition, you're in peak condition for like a month or two. And then it, it goes to, you know, the poop. So um, just think about that right there. So I think that he made an effort to get in peak condition. If any player on this earth makes that an effort to get in peak condition, they will find out things about their game that they've never experienced in their life, period. We don't got to go into anything else. Well, what about this and what about that? No, get in condition. And if you want to learn more, watch some film on Dennis Rodman. I mean, those are, these are just simple, basic ways that you can impact a game of basketball. But if I see these step backs and all these different moves, I do that. And I'm telling you, for, for our listeners and for you, Derek, this will help out. There's a video by Billy Donovan, and I consider this the Bible. And if somebody wants to learn about basketball, they should watch this. Is Billy Donovan, he goes, what do you do with your 95%? And basically, he articulates to the world who doesn't know much about basketball um, to learn that, yes, some people do have the ball in their hands. But primarily, if you're on the floor, and there's 10 people on the floor, five on each team, when you're on the floor, Throughout that entire game, added up, you might have the ball in your hand for 5% of the time. The other 95% of the time, you do not have the ball. So I need you to explain me right now, Derek, why are we working on having the ball in our hand so prevalently? But this, this is the facts of the game. So I chose to take, I think, four effects want more than one. So the person with the ball in their hand, cool. Now go back to your point with Clay Thompson. When he's running around, the defense has to worry about those four people, not the one person with the ball. Right. You see what I'm saying? It's just a little different way to think. Absolutely. Um, You're not worried about Draymond Green at the high post with the basketball. You're worried about the other four cutters flying across screens and uh, doing split cut actions and all those sort of stuff. Those are the guys you're worried about. And yeah, elevator screens. And then Draymond go, oh, you ain't worried about me? Cool. I'm, I'm better. I'm better when you don't worry about me. <laughs> exactly. And that, and going back to the point I said earlier about, you know, Sam Mitchell at the Adidas camp, you know, are, they're not going to, you know, they're, they're not going to give you the ball when James Harden's on the team, when Chris Paul, when Trey Young, when John Morant, when all these Damian Lillard, with all these great, great point guards in it, we're in a league where point guard play has never been higher. 
has never been greater than it is right now. So it just, it just extenuates what we've been talking about. Like it's, it's, it's never been harder to be a starting point guard on one of the 30 teams in the NBA. So if you want to, you know, continue to go down that road to, you know, having the ball in your hands and really trying to be one of those 30, then Hey, more power to you. But I think both of us can probably say at this point, you're going to have much more success learning to be learning to play the 95% than you are to master the five. 100%. And I, I, I'm a connection guy. Like I said, I got to always connect it back. How did Fred Van Vliet start? Mm, exactly. Rockford, Illinois, undrafted. We, uh, he played, I'm pretty sure he played with um, Ron Baker at uh, Wichita State, I believe. Uh, if State. I'm not mistaken. And yeah. Anthony Early. Yeah. And then when he gets to Toronto with the nine, he undrafted, but he has to go to the G League. But then when he comes up to the NBA team, he's in the corner pocket. That's right. He's not with the ball in his hands. Nope. And then because he defends, hustles, talks, that keeps him on the floor long enough. Then he hits some corner pocket threes. They find out he can do that. Then next thing you know, he goes in his second year, and then the ball's in his hands. And now he can do, he can do whatever he wants with the ball in his hands. Sure but look, can. he came in the back door. He took the trash out. He did the recycling. You know, he did all the, the, the dirty work. And then now, no, go, oh, come on. You can drive. You can, he gets all the, the benefits now. So that's an example to connect it back to Toronto and, and, and to, to the Raptors. But that's an, a pure example of somebody who went from the, the worst scenario, but was humble enough to, to find out here, this is my plight. This is where I'm at. Even though I was a point guard my whole career, I was a point guard at Wichita State, you know, humility. He had to humble Absolutely. himself and, realize I don't got all the answers hum I think this age group of player or this era believes when you say humility that like you're diminishing your confidence right no which is not the case no I think you get more confident because you know who the hell you are exactly self-awareness going back <laughs> to that again to your point yeah so that this stuff isn't as complicated as it gets made and when we got on tv and all this different stuff and it, it looks like there's basic things that were in the game in 1950 that are still here in 2020 that work really, 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 really well. Um, and we got to get back to that stuff. And so that to me, I love the game of basketball. I want for the game of basketball to move forward. I don't want it to have these like dips and valleys. I feel like we have been going like this for a long period of time. This is really the only time since I've been alive that I felt like, yo, this is kind of alarming. It doesn't feel like that. Um, but this bubble, the stuff in the um, what's going on right now, that's bringing a lot more passion out. So who knows if this does a little shakeup in the game that's needed? Um, because look, you got four games on a day, people watching games nonstop. It's never been like if this is the playoff time when it normally is. You know, you got a, two games a day, and then we're not gonna have another game for three or four days or so. And so, right. this has got a chance for players if they're taking advantage of this. There's not a day I, I watch a game and I'm not taking some type of notes. Like, I, I, I write something down on a game. I'm going to learn something. Like, I just – I was talking – me and my buddy talked about that for like an hour, talking over that little palm play yesterday. Right. And then here we go. Today, less than 24 hours, we're talking about it again. Why don't players have this type of excitement to want to learn something? And then I also see coaches, like on these videos – that they're teaching without excitement. So then, mm -hmm. yeah, your kid, your players aren't going to learn the way they should. Um, be have a learner's mindset, a beginner's mindset to learn. We all got Sam Mitchell's learning. That's why he's teaching the way he's mm -hmm. teaching. Absolutely, mm -hmm. to I'm totally with you. All right, I've taken a lot of your time here. Let's let's wrap this up with a little uh, NBA playoff talk and uh, what you think Portland's chances are against the Lakers. Because I know a lot of people, you know, there, there's a reason the Lakers are an eight seed. You know, the LeBron James of the world, the Anthony Davis, you know, the role players have uh, played well, despite the fact that we maybe don't know who the third option will be on any given night. Uh, but yeah. they all do their role well. Frank Vogel has coached the hell out of this team, specifically defensively. Uh, this team has been really good all year. And when you have LeBron James running the show, your offense is almost guaranteed to be at least passable. So there's nothing to worry about there. Um, and I think the and I think the thing that the Blazers are going to have to worry about is not are they going to be able to score. I think are you going to be able to defend um, against yeah. the Lakers, and that's that's going to be a, a tough task. And you know now, now we get into a little bit more of the gritty personnel 
uh, conversations. Who who is that? Who is going to be yeah, who, the matchups? Who is actually going to be the guy that guards Anthony Davis? Uh, you know, Hassan Whiteside really didn't look good uh, last night. Unfortunately, you know, Nurkic maybe a little slow of foot to guy, guard a guy like Anthony Davis, and you know, ninety five percent of the league is probably slow of foot to guard a guy like Anthony Davis. The primary matchup on LeBron James is going to be questionable from Portland's standpoint. So the, that that I think is probably going to be their biggest. Uh, the, the, you know, their biggest detriment to see if they can win is uh, can they defend the Lakers? Cause I think they can score. I, I, I don't think there's any doubt that they can score enough points. They've proven that they've got the personnel to be able to do that. Um, I just, I just wonder where the, where the matchup is for LeBron for AD uh, how the benches match up. That's that, that sort of thing. And, and, and you know, it's tough. It's tough. There's a reason there's there we're, we're talking about a one, eight matchup here. Right. So. Yeah, no, and it's not a typical 1-8 matchup. And also, you've already heard prior to the bubble, before the bubble, this was on like May or June when LeBron did a, um, a podcast, I think it was with Channing Fry, and he had said on there like, man, I don't want to see Portland. Hmm, like, I didn't see so, that. Yeah, no, it's – yeah, the podcast with Channing Fry and um, Richard Jefferson and another girl, Allie Clifton. Yeah. But yeah, he basically on there is like, no, nah, th and this is prior to this stuff going on. So now he's all, you know, Blazers and Lillard are all fired up and playing, and they're playing with – you got the situation going on with Nurk. It's it's like a Molotov cocktail right now right. of emotion and, and stuff going on. And I believe that the Lakers are, are more fearful of that. Blazers are playing on house money right now. They don't have – True. Right now there's nothing that they have to fear or worry about. I think you just go and play um, – you can't guard AD straight up. They don't have somebody to do that. Um, or LeBron, I think you got to some, send some doubles sometimes at them. You got to go get the ball out of their hands early so you don't have to double them. So, like, if, for instance, if, you know, they get a rebound, deny LeBron. The ball got to right. go to somebody else. Now LeBron maybe get it on the half court late in the shot clock. Mm. Um, same thing. You know, don't let – AD get early post position. You know, if it is a white side guard him, then we got to send somebody else and load up to make him pass. It doesn't have to be a hard double team, yeah. but load up on him. And yeah, because uh, those guys, you have to get the ball at their hands. Case in point, what did Brooklyn do for um, when they played against Portland? Yeah. You know, you saw some intelligent, yeah. yeah, but not not an aggressive chap, no. a trap like kind of where they're pointing yeah. them in to, to a, a spot and saying, hey, feel free to like use a lot more energy to kind of beat us out of this. And I think maybe you might do it, but then you're going to have to weigh, you know, risk reward you using this energy now versus later. And, and you see, he, he said, like, oh, man, I ain't gonna mess with that. I'll pass that. I'll, I'll, I'll save my energy for later. That's that's the decision that's being made. I just want to articulate that there's not microphones on the players saying that. So right. you don't know the thoughts that's going through these guys head. That's, that's what he's saying there. If not, as soon as he passes it, put it in Steph Curry's hand. They double team Steph Curry when he passes it. Soft or hard double team, tell me what you think Steph's going to do. You can guess. Yeah. Put Draymond yeah. in the middle of the floor, four on three situation. Find who you need He's to find. He's going to cut out of that. Well, yeah, that too, yeah. Yeah, I'm saying if if you double Steph – when he passes it, he's going to cut. Oh, gotcha. Okay. I thought you meant when yeah. he had the ball. Yeah, when he doesn't have yeah, the ball. Because you, remember, yeah, the yeah. point is, is that energy conservation. Correct, yep. Yeah. And But going back to the Lakers' point, that's what they that's what they would have to do with AD is 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 get it out of his hands. And then LeBron, I mean, you just got to go out there and play, man. It's going to be more of them team defense and get it done. But I believe the Blazers got every chance to get it done right now. Um that all rides on their ability to play together and then, and then Litter continue to do what he's doing right now, leading the team. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and you make a good point. Like, let's face it, like they're, the Blazers have a good a chance to beat the Lakers as they ever had, especially with the bubble, no home court advantage. Like, I don't care. You can pump all the crowd noise you want, all the virtual fans. It's, it's not the same, right? It's, it's, not, it's not the same. It's the same court. It's the same rims. It's the same people watching on TV. There's no, there's, there's none of that other stuff, right? It's just, uh, we're all in. Perception. Say it again, sorry. Better depth perception. There's wall. Right. Do you see the black behind? I don't know if you understand about NBA arenas or college arenas. When there, when there's the seats behind the, the air, Yeah. as a player, you're not in high school gyms. There's wall. There's things that are solid behind it. So you have good depth perception. You have to learn the depth perception of playing in those big arenas. You don't necessarily have that down here at the um, uh, – Just World call it the bubble in Florida. Disney. Yeah, the bubble, whatever. 
they, they're, there's um, better depth perception because there's a solid thing behind the basket. Right. So that's why you've seen a lot of these players shoot at a much higher level. So I think Lillard found that out right away. It was like, oh, we're going to take advantage of that. Shooters know that. And two, when you get into certain gyms, I don't care what you say. I do not care. I do not care. Some gyms are just like, this is a shooter's gym. Yeah. I need you to understand that. Like, and if you sat down and talked with Lillard, he going to say that to you. Um, he, he likes the rims. He yeah, likes everything. You can see it. He's getting all the – I mean, it's, 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 you just go on shooters when you go in a certain gym. He's like, man, I love these rims. I like how it smells. I like whatever. Yeah. Um, no, you I'm with you. He settled into that. I'm with you. You know, even when I play pickup, you know, there's some, there's some places I go where I'm like, hmm – the shot's going to feel good today. You know what I mean? You just, you, you <laughs> like how, you just like how it touches the rim. You like, you know, those chamber shots when it just hits back rim and down uh, yeah. where you, the net doesn't even move. You feel, you feel a couple of those go down. You're like, mm, I like it. I like yeah. it. I, and it just gets your confidence up and you didn't, you haven't even made a shot yet. And you just like how your surroundings make you feel. So no, I, I, I totally get it. I mean, I've, yeah. I've never played like organized basketball or anything in my life like I'm just like learning everything I can off of you know YouTube and watching all the guys that I've mentioned before and just playing as much pickup as I can uh, I actually went to uh, Ryerson University uh, one of the better yeah, Cana- yeah one of the better Canadian programs um, in the country uh, I would say we went to the national championship quite a few uh, quite a few times in recent years and you know one of the coaches Roy Rana is actually the assistant yep. coach now for the Sacramento Kings yeah so didn't, uh, be, didn't that guy used to be associated with um Canada basketball too? Absolutely. Yes, he did. He actually, uh, his Canada team actually beat uh, John Calipari's uh, under 19, uh, I believe at, um, I, can't, I don't remember what the tournament was, but uh, it, it, it was a team with uh, RJ Barrett and some of the, uh, some of the younger you Canadian go. guys. Yeah. And he was, he was leading that, uh, that team over Calipari's team. So I, I mean, this that is, game. Yeah, that so was over that, overseas. That's when RJ Barrett balled out. Yes, correct. Yeah, that would be that would be it. So he's he's had a lot of experience. You yeah, you learn a lot just by watching his teams playing, how disciplined they are, and you know uh, that sort of stuff. So that's uh, you know that that really kind of sparked the basketball culture in Ryerson. So getting back to my point, I just played like you know just a lot of pickup and just trying to learn the game uh, myself and all that sort of stuff. So that's always been fun. But um, so the last thing I want to ask you, I want to leave you on is uh, give me a, give me a finals prediction. You got a, you got a East versus West finals. Um, the, what I had before the season was Bucks Lakers. Now I don't really feel that great about the Lakers right now. Uh, I feel probably a little bit better about the Clippers, but it's going to be hard for me to deviate from my preseason pick. So I'm just going to go and die on that Hill uh, and hope that it's uh, and hope that it's right. But uh, I want to put it in your hands. What do you, what do you got for a finals prediction and who do you got winning? I think you might like this, but I'm going to live a little. For me, I, I believe that things are wide open right now just based on what I watched um, and getting a feel for seeing everybody. Um, I've always been uh, a Toronto fan, so I think Toronto is going to make it. it easy. I, I just like what they stand for, how gritty they are, and I also like the narrative of them doing it without um, Kawhi there to show that, um, yes, he did help and all that stuff, but look at the foundation of the stuff we do here this actually helped Kawhi be better um, here. And then also I would like to see them go against Portland. So Toronto go against Portland. I believe that's, that's realistic. Um, You got, you know, Lakers haven't had everybody this year. You, you deal, they're a little bit older. You're dealing with some injuries and different stuff. Then you got Clippers. They haven't had everybody healthy, different narratives and things going on. Haven't been able to build chemistry with a new team. Um, Denver, same type of thing. You, You know what I'm saying? They got all these different teams that, you're like before in March, they were a certain narrative and things were a certain way. But now after the pandemic or you know, after the quarantine and now that they're in the bubble, their teams are different. The makeup the of window. the teams yeah. are different. And so based on where things are at right now, like if we're looking at like a meter or something, I think Portland is the hottest team in the West. Hmm. Yeah. If it's not one of the hottest team in the NBA, but, but just for the West right now, out of all the other teams, I think that, there's not a team in the West that's like, yeah, I'm looking forward to playing Portland. Like, nah, like nah. we're watching the bubble games. <laughs> they w- just went through pretty much everybody, right? Right. And the Clipper game was the Portland's game to win. Yeah. I mean, there was like four or five different scenarios outside of Damian Lillard's two free throws that the game was in Portland's hand to fully win. For sure. Um, so I think they felt that too. You yeah. know that type of stuff when you, as a team and as a player, um, and you're going, you know what, here, let's just tighten up here. We'll be fine moving right. forward. 
when losses that game almost feels like season. wins. You know what I mean? A loss almost feels like a win when you, when you, when everything executed, right. You're like, damn, you know what I mean? Like two free throws, like miss two missed free throws. Like that's going to, that, that, you know, that, that happens like rarely, but our defense, the way we rotated, the way we, you know, communicated on this night or how we executed all came together so well. And so, yeah, I, I totally get what you're saying on that front for sure. For me, I don't even put the, that on Lillard's two free throws. Like I'll be honest, like even when it happened and at the end, that, was, I, that wasn't my feel on that. I looked at probably three to four defensive possessions um, prior to that on C.J. McCollum mm. that I thought, and then on the very last play on the scramble where he switched with Nurkic, Terrence right. Mann beat Nurkic baseline. He almost fell down. He kicked it out, and then they rotated and 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 uh, up to uh, Rodney Magruder, and C.J. was scrambling the whole time. He wasn't aware of who he had or at all, and he started that process by switching. So – these are the areas where I would go if we're – it's not about fault, but finding areas where we needed to fix and why we lost. It was not – I 100%. I would not have said it was 0-3, though, even though the narrative you look at the paper right. or whatever is like that because it's glaring. That's easy to, to point out. Um, it's harder to look in between lines and go, like, look, man, I could show you four or five glaring defensive breakdowns on that. And then the one play on Patrick Patterson where he just was um, – floating around CJ was and then they lobbed it over and then he's like oh I'm gonna block his shot like well, when do you block shots like that do you mm -hmm. get what I'm saying so those are just um not being aware plays so. absolutely well man uh Beno I I can't thank you enough for coming on here today man you really gave me uh you were very generous with your time really took me to school a little bit with uh all the player development stuff and you know kind of really reading in between the lines, the stuff that is important. Uh, we talked a lot of, about a lot of good topics and uh, surprisingly we're on the same page for a lot of stuff, which kind of makes yeah. me feel good about where, uh, where I am in terms of knowing a lot of the stuff that you're an expert on, which, uh, which I would you got consider. IQ, so, man. Yeah. You got absolutely. IQ. Like you keep, keep, yeah. And it's just about like, I got to challenge myself as we all do about um, what's the right stuff you're learning because there's so much information in the game of basketball. You could just start consuming it because you're like, there's so much. And it's like, I've tried to narrow it down to some pillars of, of what I believe is most important. You know, and you got conditioning, basketball IQ, you got defense, you got rebounding. And I think kind of teamwork, how do you play with the team and how do you uh, work into a team? If you can stay in those kind of pillars of development and master those first, once you come out of those, you can pretty much do whatever you want to do because you'll have a really good understanding of how to win games and what it takes to win games and play with other players. Absolutely. Totally agree. Well, uh, I'll, I'll let you go and enjoy the rest Thanks. of your day in uh, what seems to be a hot day out there yeah. in, in Portland. Uh, <laughs> enjoy the rest of your day, man. And uh, hopefully we can do this again. I really enjoy talking to you. And uh, I, I really did learn a lot just in the, in the time that we, we spoke today. So uh, much appreciated and uh, enjoy uh, watching the rest of the playoffs. I think it's going to be a good one. Thanks. Appreciate it, Derek. Looking forward to it. Likewise, man. Have a great one. Peace.